This week on the show, I am joined by patristics powerhouse Mike Aquilina to discuss the issue of how the church fathers, how the early church used, read, and understood the Bible. It's a really important subject to dig into, I think, because the scriptures are for many evangelicals or Protestants like I was, what forms the church, what forms our understanding of the church, but how did the very first Christians actually read, understand, and use the scriptures? How did they do that to solve doctrinal issues, to disputes within the church, to understand the relationship between tradition and, and the scriptures, to figure out what were the actual scriptures themselves, and how to explain the faith to those who weren't within the Christian sphere? These questions tackled, and many more, this week as Mike joins me to understand how how the early church used the Bible. It's a great episode. Please do enjoy it. Please like it. Tell a friend and hit the bell so you get notified each week when these videos come out. Thanks so much. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. If you're listening on podcasts, please make sure you leave a rating or review on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. That really helps push the podcast out to new people. And if you're watching on YouTube, thank you over at youtube.com slash The Cordial Catholic. Please make sure you subscribe to that channel and hit the button so you're notified of new videos as they come out each and every week. Uh, friends, we're in for an absolute treat this week. I am joined by one of your favorite guests and one of my favorite guests as well, uh, Mike Aquilina. To talk Talks about early church stuff here. Mike is, of course, the author of about a billion and a half books, <laughs> many on the, on the early church, including The Fathers of the Church, The Mass of the Early Christians, uh, How the Choir Converted the World, uh, The Healing Imperative, and, and many, many more. He's been on this show a number of times as well. I'll link to those in, in the, uh, the show notes. He is the executive uh, vice president of the St. Paul Center and a contributing editor to Angelus News. Amongst other places, he appears everywhere. If you haven't seen him before, I don't know where, where you've been. And rumor has it, Mike, that there's a new course at Steubenville offering in the fall. It's called Mike Aquilina Studies. <laughs> and it's a liberal arts degree, uh, as I understand it. So there's a bit of music involved in there as well. And of course, studying your corpus, all the works of the early church, and a bit of creative writing and, and some cooking in there as well, I think, is <laughs> part of the curriculum, Mike. <laughs> I... It's not correspondence, it's not distance, you know, a remote course, so I can't, I can't take it. But those listeners in the Steubenville area might be interested in pursuing that course. Uh, Mike, thanks for being here again. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back. You never learn. I don't know. You know what? I don't, I don't learn, actually. I, keep, I don't know what keeps happening. You keep writing books, I keep having you back on the show. Eventually, you'll run out of things to write about, and I'll run out of time to have you on the show, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a, I think there, Mike, I think there's a last, if I can take one more jab at you, there's a, actually a formula, I think, a formula where, where uh, the number of books or the number of books you have on the go is maybe inverse to hell freezing over, I think, Mike. Like, so at a certain point, if you stop, we're all in trouble, Mike. <laughs> Just keep going, keep going. Well, I'm going to try. As long as I have mouths yeah. to feed, I'm going to yes. keep writing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, this book is How the Fathers Read the Bible. Uh, scripture, liturgy, and the early church. Didn't mention that in the introduction, mentioned everything else other than that. Uh, I gotta say, Mike, this is a fantastic book, and there's one primary reason for me that draws me into a topic like this, and it has to do with the genesis of this show hmm. and my own conversion experience. Um, I've, in the very first episode of the show, which I hope nobody listens to because it's terrible, and it's very, very poorly produced, it's, you know, three and a half years ago, I, I made that episode, and I kind of talk about my, my journey, and it, it really began for me when a pastor that I was working for, as, as a Protestant still, he was doing a degree in patristics, and he was encountering the early church fathers and wrestling with his own Catholic upbringing, now as a, as a Pentecostal pastor of this church that I was, I was working for. And he brought these questions to me as his, you know, his, his intern, bouncing ideas off of me. And one of his ideas was how, how the early church, how the church uses scripture and, and tradition and liturgy and how these things all kind of fit together. That was the first question that really got me on a journey to eventually becoming Catholic by answering or asking and answering these questions. So this topic for me is a very fascinating one because it really hits at the root of my own faith journey into the Catholic Church. So I wonder if we can kind of begin there. If we're looking at the early church, those first Christians, what was their relationship with Scripture? Well, we have to have to do away with so many of our 
of our notions. So many things yeah, that, yeah. that are like wallpaper to us because they're so familiar. Because what is the Bible to us today? The Bible is something that's available. It's at our fingertips. You know, I got a smartphone. I have infinite Bible study resources, resources available to me by my smartphone. Look around me, all of these books here. I probably have between 50 and 100 different versions of the Bible available to me. I have I have copies of the Bible that could fit in my pocket handily, and I could take it out wherever I am, whenever, and I could study the Bible, okay? This, this would have been unthinkable, beyond the wildest dreams of the early yeah, Christians, yeah. because because so much of what we have today is dependent on electronic media or the printing press, right? So for them, there was no Bible. If if you had a church somewhere out in the, the boondocks, okay, you might not even have all of the scriptures at your disposal. You would have whatever you could scrounge up the money for, okay? And you would preach from those scriptures. And this is the way it was in those early centuries. Um the the scriptures were not something that were that were usually gathered together in one place between two covers okay they were out there they were considered authoritative they were considered inspired and inerrant and all of those other good things but they weren't generally available to people so where where did they get their love of the word of god they got it at the liturgy okay because that's where the scriptures were proclaimed Okay, the scriptures were read aloud at every liturgy, and that's where they were cracked open. That's where they were they were interpreted in the sermons. Okay, from the earliest days of the church, the the congregations would gather for the for the Eucharist, gather for baptisms, gather for these sacramental occasions, and when they did gather, the scriptures were proclaimed. And they were interpreted. And these were powerful moments, divine moments, really, moments of revelation for the people uh, in, the, in, in, in the congregation. Uh, this is how the Christians encountered the Bible. It was always in the context of the liturgy. Moreover, this is the way the scriptures themselves witness to the scriptures. Okay, They show us that the scriptures were meant to be proclaimed. They were meant to be received in the liturgical assembly, received uh, during the ritual public worship of the church. We see this in the New Testament. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's implicit. Sometimes it becomes explicit in the writings of St. Paul. He gives instructions for the reading of these these letters in the assembly. And there are similar instructions from St. John in the book of Revelation. We, we see our Lord uh, in in you know, following the Old Testament worship, reading in the synagogue in the context of the Sabbath liturgy. And it's that way all through the Old Testament, too. When Moses delivers the law, he does so in the context of a sacrificial liturgy. He sprinkles, he reads the law to the people, and then he sprinkles them with the sacrificial blood. And he says, behold, the blood of the covenant. So this is just the way that God intended, the way that God revealed for the scriptures to be encountered by ordinary Christians. Yes, we should be doing devotional reading of the scriptures. Yes, we should be studying because we can. We are living with resources that are, again, beyond the wildest dreams of the early Christians, and they would be appalled that we're not taking advantage of them more than we are. But still, the primary point of encounter with the, with the Word of God is in the liturgy. When we hear it proclaimed, and when we hear it interpreted in the sermons, because that's a graced moment. That's the moment intended by God for our reception of his word. Yeah, I think that's so interesting, Mike. I remember I had Jimmy Aiken on the show a number of, of, a number of years back now. I think actually he had a book in the Bible, a thin little book kind of intro to the Bible. And he actually in there, because he's Jimmy Aiken, went through and calculated the price it would cost uh, to, to – uh, make the scrolls and the papyrus and those things that that uh, early Christians had their Bibles in the, the, those the, that form of the Bible. What it would cost, and the costs were astronomical to yeah. afford even one book of the Bible. Never mind right. several books or several scrolls. It was just it was just mind boggling, and so to think that 
And this I find really interesting because you, you mentioned the importance of private study of the Bible because we have it. We should be, be doing that. But to think that that was the primary mode of how the early church understood the Bible, that the primary mode is uh, were these Bible studies where they kind of pour over the word and dissect mm-hmm. them and argue back and forth about what they mean and interpret them kind of for themselves or in these small groups. This really was not even thinkable. For, for the early church, right? That kind of study of the Bible in that sense, that private or, or small group study, right? I have a, I have a fascination with archaeology. Uh, so I, 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 you know, subscribe to the various news services that regularly report on, on archaeological discoveries. And um, just a few years back in Egypt, uh, there was found a, a little receipt. It was actually a receipt for a purchase of lumber or something like that. And on the back of the receipt, someone had copied out very carefully the passage from the New Testament that describes uh, the narrative of institution where our Lord, uh, you know, uh, celebrates the first Eucharist at the Last Supper. And uh, and whoever had this, you know, folded it up and put it in another piece of paper, <laughs> sewn carefully, and then wore it like I'm wearing a scapular right oh, now, yeah, right? Yeah. Wore it that way so that he could take it out and read it at his leisure. You know, it's it was this beautiful mo- uh, discovery for me because it shows the kind of devotion that the early Christians had to the Word of God. Uh, but they they went with what they could get their hands on, and it wasn't much. It wasn't much. Today, again, we have all of these wonderful books, and and we should be making the most of what we have. Yeah, absolutely. I think the idea of of scripture being primarily heard in the liturgy is really interesting too, right? Because I I know for for me encountering the Catholic liturgy as we have it today, scripture is is unpacked and is presented in a way that follows a regular cycle of readings and these these certain verses come out at certain times of the year and certain verses kind of work work together. And I'm thinking of of the, the, the lay Catholics, lay Christians back in the early church who wouldn't have necessarily been literate or would have understood the the history of, of salvation, how you know the, the Old Testament, the New working together, all these different things. They weren't theologians. They weren't well-read necessarily. They weren't uh, super well-educated in many cases, I don't think, right? So the, the liturgy was the way that they heard and understood Scripture unpacked for them. Not this idea that the, the the church, as sometimes is mythologized or mistakenly kind of critiqued for keeping the scriptures from the people, the church was there to rightfully unpack scripture yes. because yes. It, it needed to be right. That was that was an act of service, not yes. an act of, uh, of 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 hiding that right or or, or deception. I don't think, right right. right. And for three hundred years, uh, the 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 church was persecuted. Christians were persecuted. The practice of Christianity. Um, was was illegal and it was a capital crime. So if you were caught with Christian books, if you were caught going to going to church, going to mass, um, you could die for it on the next day. Uh, it, it was it was that simple. So for so many years, the church had to protect those books, preserve them, copy them out laboriously and expensively, as you point out, by hand. They had to get skilled labor to do that, and then these were the things that were hunted down. Uh, there are plenty of accounts of this from the the, the documents of the early church uh, that that the um, the pagans wanted to get their hands on those books because they knew that they could diminish a local congregation if they took the scriptures from them. So so this is something that happened quite frequently. Now, once Christianity became legal in the early three hundreds. Uh, and with the with the accession of of Constantine as as emperor, the first Christian emperor, and the first to to make the practice of Christianity legal, um, it was more common to have books, liturgical books, scriptural books, and it became very common to produce lectionaries, so that the readings from Scripture were distributed over the course of a year, and that so that the people could could familiarize themselves with the life of Christ, with the life of Israel, with the revelation of God down through the ages. And they would celebrate the feasts of the year in the liturgy. And the feasts were designed to rehearse the dogmas of the church over and over and over again. So they 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 got used to the idea of the incarnation. They got used to Jesus, the idea of Jesus Christ as true God, 
and true man. They got used to the idea of Mary as the mother of God. They got used to the idea of the real presence in the Eucharist. All of these things were rehearsed repeatedly year after year throughout your lifetime. The artwork in the church was there to reinforce what was encountered in the scriptures. So if we look at the artwork that, that survives from the second century, third century, fourth century, it's all biblical scenes. And sometimes they're arranged typologically so that the, you know, we have the scenes of the Old Testament and then we have the scenes of the New Testament fulfillment. If you, if you look at the uh, mosaics, that, uh, that are still there from, from the early church in Ravenna in Italy, um, you'll see uh, that around the altar, there are all the, the typological anticipations of the Eucharist from the Old Testament. There's Melchizedek, the first priest mentioned in the Bible, and he's offering his bread and wine. There's Abraham offering his son Isaac, just as, as, uh, as we're offering the Son of God you know, uh, to the Father. Uh, from 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 the altar, all of the artwork, and uh, and presumably all of the music, everything else that was in the liturgy, uh, was there to to reinforce what was being proclaimed from the scriptures, and that's the way it is still today. This didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, this is this is the this has been the way of the church since those early days. Uh, but really, the more um, the more freedom we have. Uh, the more we can use these great things at our disposal. You know, we should be we should be super Christians today because of our access to the scriptures, because of our ability to make sacred art and make sacred music, all of these things that were done to get the word of God out there into the minds and hearts of the people, um, we should be able to do far better today with what we have. I think it's a great point, and, and and please do keep hearing that home because it's true, right? This should make us, this should draw us deeper into the Word of God, make us more yes. grateful for what we yes. have, right? Knowing yes. how how different it was, I think that, that that's a great point. Keep, keep making that, Mike. Every keep bringing that, bringing us back to that that grounding. We we do appreciate that. Well, you triggered it by mentioning the lectionary, <laughs> yeah. and the lectionary is something that has been there since the early church, and it really uh, became more fixed once the Christianity was legal and, and people were able to access these books. Now, the church revised its lectionary in the 20th century and made it a three-year cycle so that it could fit even more scripture. <laughs> and today we're living longer, most of us. And uh, and so we get to rehearse the life of Christ and the life of Israel and, uh, and the promise and the fulfillment over and over again, over a three-year cycle over the course of our lives. So this has been so successful in my opinion that it's that's it's even been adopted by Protestant churches yeah, yeah. and 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 we're we're at the point now where so many churches are all on the same page, so to speak, or literally on the same page in the lectionary, <laughs> because the Presbyterian churches, Methodist churches, Episcopalians, Lutherans are using the revised common lectionary, which is is an adaptation of the lectionary that was produced by the Catholic Church in the early 1970s. Yeah, I think it's fascinating that the pastor I mentioned earlier, that that church, they began in this journey to use the lectionary, mm. uh, in, in it was non-denominational Protestant church. I began to use that. That's an interesting tie in there. I want to, as I listen to you explaining this and and how scripture is kind of seated in the church and how it was used in in the liturgy, it sounds to me like the answer to the question kind of of what came first or not what's more important, but maybe what was the the thing that that I don't know, I think came first, maybe is the right way of putting it. It sounds like the, the scripture is being used in the liturgy, not the liturgy being formed by the scripture necessarily. Is that is yeah. that kind of safe to say? Because that's a different formulation than I think this the kind of sola scriptura Protestant yeah. would think about how the Bible is used, right? It's, I, I think sounds that's like... Yeah, no, I think I think I think it is fair to say, and I think you're right. I think you're onto something because these ideas that we have that we select out and we try to isolate ideas like, like scripture, liturgy, and church, right? Um, read the Acts of the Apostles. There are no clear distinctions between these things, right? Where we, we find St. Paul celebrating the liturgy late into the night, right? And 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 breaking the bread and everything. Uh, so it's a Eucharistic liturgy. It's a long liturgy. He's preaching 
You know, he's interpreting the word of God. He's he's breaking the bread, uh, and uh, and he's doing it in the context of the church, the the assembly there. So so these things that we kind of abstract out were were so integrated in the in the time of the apostles. Uh, so so that they were actually integrated before there were the New Testament scriptures, right? Because they're described in the New Testament scriptures, in the Acts of the Apostles, where we see that the very marks of being a Christian in that first generation, actually in that first year of Christianity after the first Christian Pentecost, the marks of the church were the teaching of the apostles and the communion, the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Right? There's no no separation. There are no hard distinctions between scripture, liturgy, and church. We have it all at once. The teaching of the apostles and the communion, the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Read the accounts of the liturgy from Justin Martyr and Tertullian in the 100s. They walk you step by step through the liturgy. That's the order of the liturgy. And it's also the order of the liturgy when I go to mass on Sundays in my parish. So not that much has changed in the Catholic Church since the Acts of the Apostles. Things have developed, but things really haven't changed. <laughs> Something else interesting is, and I think this is a, a interesting thought experiment. I know for me, it's going to hit me like a ton of bricks when I first thought about it. But the the time between uh, you know Christianity beginning, Christ rising from the dead, and, and the the apostles going out in the missionary church, that time, the time of the 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 Bible actually being formally canonized, is a long amount of time when there was no actual scriptures as we have them today. Right. So that kind of weird little time in between there, if we're thinking of a church that was that was based on the scriptures rather than the scriptures coming out of the church and having a special place of prominence, of course, but coming out of a church versus those those scriptures forming the church, that's an interesting relationship, I think, to, to think about. Like what what was it what was it like in those in those er early many years between the church and the Bible actually being, you know, solidified as, as okay, we agree now, these are all the books. Because it didn't, as Jimmy Aiken says, fall from the sky. Right. Intact right. like this, right? Right. Uh, well, in that first generation, I'd say it was, it was an extraordinary time. It was a singular time. And the apostles spoke with the authority of scripture. They had that oh, special yeah. Yeah. authority so that they were producing the scriptures themselves. They were preaching with that authority. What we see happening in the Acts of the Apostles is 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 remarkable. It's marvelous to see. You, you know, you just you just have have these men walking the earth, and they're not perfect, okay? Because the Acts of the Apostles also shows their flaws, right? But they're not perfect men. But they have an authority invested in them that's unique in all of history. They're going ashore in places like Malta, preaching the word. Uh, you know, uh, performing these signs and wonders, and people are converting to Christ. Uh, I'm, big, I'm big in Malta, Mike. By the way, just in case you're wondering, you're what? You're big into Malta. I'm big in Malta. Are you? Show, yep. Yeah. Hello. Well, hello, everyone in Malta. Sorry. Hello, all of my family in Malta. <laughs> you know, there I, you go. I'm, I'm told that my ancestors come from Malta. It's probably them listening. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, they're going ashore in Malta, and then I got sidetracked. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, it's um, it's uh. Uh, and they're they're making a difference, you know. They're making converts. They're bringing people to Jesus Christ wherever they go ashore. Paul goes from Malta to Sicily. He goes, you know, he's on the the ship in Sicily. We know for three days. I can't imagine that Paul wasn't wasn't doing the same yeah. thing there, even if he had to do it on the ship or at the port, you know. That's the way he was. He, uh, you know, they seemed to give him a long leash. His Roman, Roman uh, attendants, and uh, and uh, and and he made the most of of, of what he had. Um, Paul had an encyclopedic knowledge of of um, of the scriptures. He had to memorize the scriptures in his training as a as a Pharisee, as a rabbi, and so he had a lot of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, at his disposal. And you can see that in his letters, he alludes to the the books of the law. He he um he he uh, he alludes to the the prophets. He he quotes the prophets. You know he works with it. He's uh he's he's uh he, he's got a command of the material. I imagine that that some of the other apostles must have had 
a pretty good familiarity with the books that we now call the Old Testament, and they made the most of what they had. But they also had a supernatural gift and a supernatural authority uh, that they were using to produce the books we call the New Testament uh, in the course of their lives. Yeah, it's such a fascinating relationship, right, between the apostles and the scriptures, because you're right, we see things happening in one place in scripture that then is recorded elsewhere, right? We see things, you know, Paul will refer to something and we see, oh, this is when that happened over here, right? And you can kind of compare and contrast things with these pieces together to <laughs> see a larger picture. And it's it's yeah. really interesting to see that kind of unfold in real time, and then that becomes the scriptures that, that we read today. I think mean, that's so interesting. And it's cool how quickly it happened, yeah. because we have the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. Yes, yes I was right? going to say. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're just a few years later. And these were the men who were baptized and discipled by the Apostles. And what are they doing? They're already quoting the Apostles as Scripture as authoritative, as revealed by God, right? And uh, and they assume that the people, even the people across the ocean, will have some familiarity with the books that uh, that we now call New Testament scriptures, right? Even all of these these terms we use are anachronisms when we're talking about that period that, that you find so attractive. Um, but uh, St. Clement of Rome is writing to, to, uh, to Christians in Corinth. He's writing a letter, a gentle letter of discipline uh, to a congregation far away. And in it, he's talking about St. Paul's Corinthian correspondence, which was not all that old at that time. I believe Clement wrote those le the, his letter um, ar around 67 AD. If I'm wrong, well, then the outer limit is about 96 AD, right? So 96 AD is still pretty darn early, <laughs> right? And, and yet already he's assuming that Christians on the other side of the ocean will have this familiarity with Paul's letters because Paul's letters held that kind of authority even, you know, a few years after his death and even a couple decades after his death. And they were read, these letters, these these, these works of the uh, apostles were read kind of on par with the Old Testament in, in liturgy. Is that right? Like they were they were kind of seen as the early, in the early church as as having, as you said, that, that kind of that kind of weight to it, that living yes. authority yes. Uh, almost immediately, right? Yes. They were, now, and and we have evidence of that from very early on. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the 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 writings of the apostolic fathers again show a deep familiarity with the gospels, for example. And uh, and by the time we get to Justin Martyr in the middle of the one hundreds, uh, we have we have Justin saying that at every liturgy, um, there were read aloud the memoirs of the apostles. You know, which is the term he uses for the gospels, because again. All of these terms that we're imposing on those books now were not in common parlance then. So when Justin talked to people outside the church, he had to refer to them uh, by their um, by their literary genre, which to the pagans would have been memoirs, right? And so the memoirs of the apostles were read in the context of every liturgy, and then they were cracked open. Then they were interpreted for the people. Again, thinking about the idea of the church making the scriptures or the scriptures kind of forming the church, uh, it, there there was this period then before the scriptures were actually formally kind of canonized as what books were in and what books were out, that there were different books floating around, different ideas of what was actual scripture. I know, I know Clement's letters at one point were perhaps read in different places as they were so close to the, the apostles, right? They were read in some places maybe a bit more authoritative than we see them now. Can we talk for a minute about how that process kind of unfolded and how the church decided of or, or settled on a canon? Was it was it, you know, because again, this is that interesting question. If you look at it, was it, was it the scriptures that formed the church or did the scriptures kind of come out of the church? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's such a fascinating question. And again, one of those questions that for me really was a catalyst for my own journey. And I think something for many people who, who grew up around scriptures, you don't really think about, but it's, yeah. a, it's a pretty formative question. Like how did, how did the Bible, <laughs> How do they make the Bible, Mike? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and and it's fascinating to see it happen. Yeah, four hours can go. <laughs> it's a pretty gradual process. It's a pretty gradual process. Uh, what I think is remarkable is that is that there seems to be a um, uh, a universal consensus, almost a silent consensus on the fourfold gospel yeah. very early. Okay, and the letters of Paul, 
Now, they weren't entirely agreed on how many letters there were <laughs> because not everybody was aware of, of, of what was out there, right? So you find you find different lists of what might be canonical. <clears throat> but, uh, but already in the 100s, you begin to see a concern um, for, for saying what's, what's inspired and what's not. And you can see why it would be necessary, because in the early 100s, there was a, a wonderful book, an entertaining book. We well, might call it a Christian bestseller put out called, <laughs> called <Da Vinci> Code? <laughs> <laughs> The Gospel of Mary. The Gospel of oh, Mary. Today, we, today we, we, we know it as the Proto-Evangelium of James, right? And it's, it, it's revered, especially in the Eastern churches. It's fanciful. It's imaginative. Um, it's, it's got some interesting in, it gives us some interesting insights into christian devotion of the blessed mother for example in the very early years of the church uh, there, it's valuable for a lot of reasons but it's not canonical it's not inspired it's not inerrant the way the books of the new testament or the old testament are inspired so what is it then <laughs> you know you 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 have the church uh, beginning to wrestle with these questions and at the same time there are many Christians writing books that try to satisfy the curiosity of believers. Because even today, we find all kinds of literary um, uh, artists uh, producing novels about the life of Christ. Uh, I know that vampire author, I um, can't remember her name. <laughs> Anne you know, Rice. Anne Rice. Anne Rice wrote a series of books trying yeah. to imagine the childhood of Jesus. Yeah, Why? Good. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because, because we don't know about his childhood from the Gospels, and we're curious. We have this healthy curiosity because we love him. You know, I want to know about my wife's childhood because I love her and I want to understand her better. We feel the same thing toward Jesus, but the books aren't there. So a novelist might feel the need to fill in the, the gaps in the narrative. It was that way in the early church too. And some very pious souls set out to write these books about the gaps in the narrative, the gospel of Nicodemus, right? These are orthodox books, but they're not inspired. You know, they're, they're, they're good books. They're edifying books they're not inspired. And the church had to make these distinctions because in the second century, there were also other books coming up that kind of had a veneer of Christianity on them. These Gnostic gospels, yeah, yeah. okay, that were being produced by teachers who were really out to subvert the apostolic tradition. They were really out to subvert the gospel as we know it um, through the tradition, through the church. Okay. So they were, they were, kind of positioning Jesus as a uh, a mystic teacher of wisdom. He he is a a teacher of wisdom. Don't get me wrong, but but he's not he's not that in the way that that's that we see in the Gnostic gospels. They see him cultivating an elite from the earth, right? Just an elite of special people who will become his special disciples and to whom he will reveal his secret knowledge that he doesn't give to the rabble. Well, <laughs> Against these people, the church responded through the through the bishops like Irenaeus, who wrote who wrote five books against the Gnostics. Um, you know, that would respond, no, no, no. The gospel is something that's objectively verifiable. It's something that's historical. You can look it up, right? And and you can check scripture. You can check tradition, right? Uh, through the through the, the the documentary trail of the church, and you can you can check the magisterium. You can check the teaching authority of bishops in the church. So Irenaeus even shows yeah, the genealogy yeah, yeah. of the bishops so that you can you know where to go to get the goods. There's no secret teaching. The church is not hiding anything from you. It's it's just the gospel, plain and simple. Okay, so for all of these reasons, the church had to begin to clarify what it meant by sacred scripture. So, as I said before, in the 100s, we begin to see Melito of Sardis put together a canon. Okay, we find the anonymous Muratorian fragment, which, which has a canon of the New Testament, because it, it's, it's intended to counteract the canon that was put together by a very wealthy heretic named Marcion, who was a shipbuilder in Rome and, and was paying to start his own church as a rival to, to the Catholic, Catholic Church, to Catholic Christianity. Marcion's, uh, ha Marcion had his own canon, and his canon was much simpler. It was the Gospel of Luke edited 
to remove all Jewish references. And the and and the uh, the, the epistles uh, the epistles of Saint Paul again edited to remove anything. Um, referring to the Old Testament in a positive way, because Marcion believed that the God of the Old Testament was different from the God of the New. So against these efforts, the church had to establish a very clear table of contents for sacred scripture. By the, by the middle of the fourth century, you have Athanasius of Alexandria setting out that, that table of contents as we can find it in any New Testament today. Um, by by the end of that century, you have it ratified in councils and uh, and and then approved by the Pope in Rome. So by the early fifth century, there there can be no question about which books are canonical and which are not. One of the criteria that they used for determining canonicity, as we see in the great controversy of the over the Gospel of Peter in the one hundreds, um, was uh, whether the book was read aloud in the liturgy or not okay because scripture can be read aloud in the liturgy but these other books like the gospel of peter could not yeah i think again that's so interesting right what a fascinating point and if you had told me these things before you know years ago as i was uh, in, my, in my protestant church i would have said well mike i mean scripture is scripture like god put that together he put the table of contents together we, this is our bible right but <laughs> When you begin to, to ask those really probing questions, how the early church used the Bible, well, you begin to encounter these strange situations where it, it seems to me, and I don't know where around this, that the, the church really was on that authority that the apostles passed down to their successors, on the authority that, uh, you know, the magisterium, the bishops and these councils, the pope eventually. It's that authority that really, I mean, gosh, the, what's being read in the liturgy? Like yeah. right there is is what, it would depend on what that local bishop would allow in the liturgy. So there's all along the chain, you're looking at the early church the relationship with the Bible is is based on the authority that the church has to say which books belong right there's there's never there's never a sense that these books kind of just coalesce themselves or or some really strange this is what i i think would have imagined before mike that there's some kind of internal evidence from one book to the next and that they all fit together and they they prove that themselves from from the bible none of that i don't think mike was was used to determine the canon it was on the on the backs of of the apostles and their successors yeah. down through the ages, right? What what you see in the Gospels and, and then what you see played out through all the New Testament is that Jesus gave certain people tremendous authority. Yeah, He, he called them out. He called them apart. He selected them and he brought them out. And it, it's not like the Gnostics said to give them secret knowledge, but to give them authority and to give them power, these certain people. And he gave them powers of binding and loosing, not only on earth, but in heaven. This this should, you know, make our, our heads explode. <laughs> you know, he gave the, them this power, and they weren't perfect people. You know, one of them betrayed him. Someone, Jesus, had given this power, you know. And then he, he breathed on them. He breathed on the 11. He gave them the Holy Spirit, and he said, he said, you know, he told them to go out and forgive sins. Whoever, you know, what, whoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven, right? This is tremendous power. This is power that only God had up to this point. And now these certain people are invested with this power. That's the Catholic principle. Right, that that people receive real power through the sacraments, and that people receive real authority through the sacraments, through certain sacraments, and they they um, and it's through that authority that that God has worked through history to develop these things, the canon, the scriptures, the liturgy. So it's through the church and through through the authority uh, that's invested in certain people in the church that God has worked this out over the course of centuries. Some of these things he's still working out, you know, and we're we're privileged to see these developing before our eyes. <laughs> well said. Let's talk about how some of these early apologists used used scripture in that relationship. Thinking of Justin Martyr, you mentioned him earlier. What you know, I, I it may be the first church apologist. You can fill that gap in, but how did somebody like like him use use scripture, use tradition, use what he learned from the apostles to to evangelize, to kind of give this apologetic argument for for early Christianity? Well, in the time before Justin Martyr, you're pretty much um, uh, in the period that we now call the the period of the Apostolic Fathers, right? And at that time, 
the the authorities in the church, the writers in in the church, are very much concerned with internal matters, internal discipline. How do we define ourselves? Yeah. How do we define ourselves against the pagans? How do we define ourselves against the Jews? Who's a Christian and who's not? How do you become a Christian? All of these very basic questions of common order within the church. So it's inside baseball. You know, that's that's um that that's what's going on in the time of the apostolic fathers. And inside baseball is very important if you want to build a good team, a strong team, a winning team, right? With with Justin Martyr, we see a shift of emphasis, a shift of interest, really, because Justin Martyr is is reaching out to the world, right? He's very much interested in presenting Christianity to a hostile audience. And not, you know, not just a hostile audience, but to any hostile audience. Um, to, um, to the Romans in authority. He writes a letter to the Senate explaining Christianity to them. You know, you've heard all these crazy rumors about Christians. Here's what's true. He writes a letter to the emperor, Antoninus Pius, trying to do the same thing, trying to speak, speak Christianity in language that these people will understand. He writes a long dialogue. It's an account of a conversation, a long conversation he had with a, a Jew, a rabbi named Trifo, um, when he was living in Ephesus. Um, and he published the account of that. Uh, they're wonderful, wonderful texts from the middle of the 100s, very early point in Christian history. And they're, they're valuable because, again, they describe the church as it was then. And I think Roman Catholics, uh, the Eastern Orthodox, can look at these documents and they can recognize a church that they still attend today. Um, uh, you, Keith, as, as an evangelical some years ago, probably wouldn't have had such an easy time of that. <laughs> um, because these are deeply sacramental texts. Even Justin Martyr, uh, when he's talking to pagans, will talk about the sacraments, which is something that Christians generally didn't do. They kept secret. They kept mum about the sacraments because they didn't want them to be mocked. They knew that they would not be understood apart from faith. And yet Justin Martyr just speaks freely about them. He kind of breaks the rule there. Um, and it's okay because in doing so, he left us he left us uh, the earliest account of the Mass and of baptism. And both of these are step-by-step -step accounts. Yeah, I think I absolutely his picture of the yeah, the, those the early liturgies is so fascinating to, to look at. And you're right, Mike. I dug into those early church fathers. I found I I know uh, Rod Bennett has a story of going to a bookstore and encountering them in these huge leather-bound volumes, and that yeah. blew him away. I, I bought a collection on Amazon for, I think, $3. But when I downloaded it, it, it was like, you know, 10 megabytes. I thought that's a pretty big pretty big book, like, uh -huh. size-wise. Downloaded it, and it was like like 11,000 pages, and I kind of went, <laughs> okay. You know, I didn't have the bookstore leather-bound experience that, that Rod had, but I had a equally modern digital experience where I downloaded it and got Eleven thousand pages. What is going on here? But you encounter someone like Justin and his uh, how he lays out what liturgy looks like. And you're right. I kind of went. Well, my church looks nothing like this. Yeah. Uh, not even nothing. Nothing was was remotely similar in terms of how that looked. And I kind of had to go. Oh, what? <laughs> and Justin what teaches teaches us so much about scripture too, as it was as it was yes. revered in those early years of the church. He's not doing it explicitly. He's not he's not teaching a course on scripture, but in dialoguing with the pagans and with Trifo, he's talking about these books and he's talking about the special status that they have within the church. When he's talking with Trifo, he's talking about how we 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 recognize the authority of of the Hebrew scriptures. But we see those fulfilled yes. in the New Testament, and he and he tells that story. You know, he's 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 bringing that um, to to this person who's who's not not um, who's not open to the message really. But he but he's 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 willing to have the conversation. What's interesting about that dialogue with Trifo is the honesty of it. Because you, you think Justin is writing this some years later. He's already across the ocean. He could have portrayed himself as the macho apologist hero <laughs> who just like won the, 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 the match, you know, and then at the end of it all, this, this, this interlocutor becomes a Christian. But that's not the way it goes. At the end of it, Trifo is still not a Christian. He's still not convinced. But the two men decide to part as friends which is a beautiful, beautiful witness to us today. 
boy, we should be listening today when, when we're living among so much division and where we're we're living among people who are just so eager to pronounce anathemas on their next door neighbors, you know, or on their Facebook friends, whatever, <laughs> you know. But here we have this example from the 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 mid the early one hundreds, really, of of two people who are who are at odds who have a serious disagreement about the nature of history, the nature of the world, the nature of salvation, uh, and they can they can still part as friends. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic lesson. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you about how the early church wrestled with the, these big topics. Like We know that the early church was was forming and understanding how, how they believed about all kinds of things, right? The nature of Christ was not, uh, you know, a, a light didn't flick on and everyone understood exactly how Christ was man and, and God at the, same, at the same time, right? These things were discussed and understood and kind of unpacked by the early church in in councils and things. So how did scripture enter into those kind of discussions? Was it a matter of we're going to search the scriptures and find these answers or or how did that relationship work between those councils and, and, you know, figuring out what we believed as, as Christians in those early days? I, I think the great model of this is Irenaeus. And as I said before, he, 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 he looks to these three points of authority, scripture, tradition, and magisterium, right? Uh, because, because these are objective points, right? It's not opinion. You know, it's not my theory or anything like that. We're, 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 we're holding ourselves accountable to scripture. We're also holding ourselves accountable to the church's interpretation of scripture and the way it's always been interpreted. So we go down through the historical record. We have a Bible study group with members who lived 1,500 years ago, 1,700 years ago, 1,800 years ago, 1,900 years ago. These are the members of our Bible study group, okay? When we want to study a question of Scripture, we find out how it's always been interpreted by the church, and we hold ourselves accountable to that. So we're not introducing novelties, for example, because the, the language has changed, because sometimes words shift in meaning, okay? And we can read Scripture and not quite get what it's saying because the words ha- have, have shifted in meaning. I love this series. It was put out by an evangelical, an evangelical publisher, but it's the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture, okay? And what it does is it goes through the Bible, verse by verse, and for every verse of the Bible, it gives you what the church fathers said about that verse. So you can w- walk through Genesis, you can r- walk through Revelation and any book in between and see what the church fathers said about every verse in scripture. Not just one father, but several fathers for, for each verse. That's a great resource and it's a it's a powerful witness to see. You know, this is what we hold ourselves accountable to, not just the latest trend in scripture study, not just the latest wild theory in scripture study, not the, just the latest academic fad. You know, what we're holding ourselves accountable to is what the church has always taught. So I think what we do today, what they did in the councils, was what Irenaeus did in in 170 AD you know they 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 looked to scripture and how it was read in the tradition they looked to the living bishops and found out what the bishops said about those particular passages of scripture this is what we see happening in the councils themselves in the acts of the councils that are, that still survive from the 5th century for example the the council of of Ephesus how did it begin it be, it began by Cyril of Alexandria standing up and um and and reading a chain of of witnesses from the fathers of the church to the interpretation of scripture on the doctrine of Mary's status so it, it's 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 what was done uh, by Irenaeus in the 100s it was done at the council of Ephesus in the 400s and it's what we're still doing today that's fantastic, Mike. I got to say, I did get my hands on one of those volumes once. I went, I, I brought it to a Protestant Bible study, and I really <laughs> got into some trouble there, Mike. As you can imagine, I began to <laughs> quote these early church fathers on the verses we were studying in this Bible study, and uh, I became pretty unpopular pretty, pretty quickly, <laughs> if I recall. But you're right, and that is a 
you know, in, in the in by and large in the Protestant world, an untapped way of understanding teachings and the Bible and Scripture, seated in history like that. But as you say, and I don't want to I don't want to sound triumphalist, but that's how the Catholic Church has intended to do it all along, right? Yeah, and sometimes it's the way it's presented. I like to think about it as a Bible study that I share not only with the people in my church, not only the people in my parish or my neighborhood, but with the pe- with people who have been living down yeah. through the ages, yeah. you know, I can go back and read what they said in interpretate in, in interpretation of a particular verse of scripture. I can find out what great Christian minds have thought about that verse down through the ages, and I can interpret it um, the way they did, or at least take that into consideration. Yeah, yeah. Hold myself accountable to it when I'm talking about that verse, because. Anytime, you know, I, I, I'm tempted to diverge from the interpretations of the fathers. I know that I'm getting into a red zone, you know, that I, I'm more likely just following my, my own um, pride or I'm following some fad because this is what, what everybody in academia is doing now oh, or, yeah. um, you know, what some, some, some scholar wrote in a book or that's, uh, that kind of thing. And, and fads come and go, academic fads come and go. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the, the teaching of the fathers remains and it remains authoritative. You know, as Catholics, we believe that if there is a certain interpretation that has gained the unanimous um, consent the, of the fathers, that if the fathers agree on the interpretation of a particular verse, um, then then we have to consider their interpretation to be to be infallible. Yeah, and it, and it's it sounds so goofy. I'll put myself in this camp. I was one of those goofs to just open your Bible in a room full of of people and begin to read it and go, yeah, I think this means this. I think this means this, and talk back and forth. There's a great place for that studying of the Bible in community like that. But yeah, to read that so out of context of how the church is always read that when we have those resources to know how the church has always read these things and what the church has said before us. I mean, that it seems goofy to do Bible study in a, in a vacuum like that, but I w- wouldn't have known better. I didn't didn't know this huge untapped resource in the church fathers and then the church teaching all the way down through through the ages. That's an enormous... Yeah. I mean... <laughs> It's and just, I don't I, like you and I are are nerds. Yeah, okay, I, Keith, we I mean yeah. we're nerds, but I I don't want to give the impression that the fathers were nerds yeah. because they weren't. Most of them were pastors, and they were very much concerned with the practical problems yeah. Yeah. of the people in their congregation. So as I as I went through this book, I tried to to show how they did that. You know, like Chrysostom has has all this wonderful material addressed to parents about how to raise their kids with the love of the scriptures and how to raise their kids with the, with a mind that's formed by the scriptures. And it's so practical. You know, he's, 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 he's uh, beginning where they are and he's, 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 um, he's referring to the customs of child rearing during, during his time, but he's also showing them how they can take those same customs and just tweak them a little bit, tweak them a little bit, and use the scriptures to raise their children and raise them right. So, so yeah, the fathers have this really practical edge because they're all pastors. There were no academics among the fathers. No, no theologians as we we think of theologians today. They were theologians, but they were they were theologians very much in practice. They were preaching the word of God from pulpits in churches. I love that. No academics. Uh, <laughs> beware, academics. of <laughs> never making it into the canon of... Some of my best yeah, friends are academics. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not, they're okay. I, I would be remiss not to talk about St. Jerome as we, oh, yeah. uh, in discussion of how the early church fathers used the Bible, because he is, I mean, for one, I, I resonate with him deeply in his sarcastic kind of affront. <laughs> uh, 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 this is, this is the cordial Catholic, but it's really an aspirational title. I'm more of a St. Jerome than I am anybody, any other church early church figure in 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 my kind of sharper edges but he his relationship with scripture is very fascinating of course for lots of reasons uh, one amongst many is is how he in one sense uh, r- ruined the uh, what we'd call the deuterocanonical books kind of spoiled them for future readers by by bringing them into question a little bit in his trans- his translating of things, he gave Protestants some suspicions uh, mm-hmm. on one hand, but did so much for scripture in, in his translation work. Uh, but but wrestled with 
with questions too, right? The relationship of the Jewish scriptures and the New Testament, yeah. um, issues of language, right? Of, of Hebrew versus the Greek and then into the Latin. What do you, I mean, we could talk for again hours just about St. Jerome, but what do you, what do you think listeners would be interested in hearing about in, in St. Jerome's colorful relationship with, with, with scripture and how his impact or how he, he used it? What do you... Well, I'd say just think about the heroism of his project. Okay, yeah. now now we ha we we do our typing on a computer. You know, we store our work, we we edit our work, and all that stuff. He didn't have any of that. Okay, he didn't have any of that, and yet what he did over the course of the lifetime is prodigious. If if anyone did anything like that today, we we just stand and marvel at the accomplishment what did he do well the 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 pope was concerned because there were so many different versions of the scriptures in latin that were making the rounds and and they didn't all agree so this was confusing the faithful because they they'd go to a different church and they'd hear a different version of the gospel you know so so the pope wanted to unify the the various latin translations of scripture, okay, these Latin translations from the original Greek of the New Testament. And so he asked Jerome to do that, which was a very controversial thing, because anytime you change the words yeah, that are proclaimed yeah. in the liturgy, you know, there's going to be war. So, so Jerome encountered a lot of resistance, a lot of opposition during this time. Even St. Augustine opposed him because Augustine thought that you shouldn't mess with the familiar texts as the people had heard them all their lives. Jerome thought it was necessary because uh, he pointed out that there were that there were um, that there were gross discrepancies among the various versions, Latin versions that were out there, and that there were even passages missing from some of the versions that were out there. So Jerome wanted to restore um, the integrity to the scriptures in their Latin translation. So in the course of that, he starts to realize that really, we need a new translation from the Greek. So now, not only is he just, uh, just making a, a unified Latin translation, but he's making a new Latin translation from the Greek. So a second time, he's going through, and he's making, this time, a fresh translation. So then he gets curious, you know, because of all of this translation work, and he thought, he thought, you know, what about the Hebrew? So he he starts to go back and he learns Hebrew for this task so that he could read the Hebrew scriptures. He could read the books of the Old Testament in Hebrew. Um, during this time, he really was influenced by the rabbis of Judaism. Uh, he learned Hebrew uh, from from them. And he uh, he he um, he 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 began uh, to to consider their account of the Old Testament canon to be authoritative. Right. So you're right. You know, he didn't want to include the Deuterocanonicals in his translation, and he's really the only one of the fathers who took that position. Still, he's Jerome, so you listen. <laughs> but here's something interesting. The Pope told him, no, you do this. And so Jerome, who knew Scripture better than anyone, knew the authority of the Pope, yeah. and he listened to the Pope, <laughs> and he did what the Pope asked him to do. It's very interesting when you see the things that he wrote to the Pope, because he would address the Pope under all of these scriptural titles that, that were accounts of his authority, his Petrine authority, his authority as the one shepherd on earth. Jerome, who was the greatest scholar of scripture during his time, knew what the authority of the papacy was, and he lived obedience to that authority in his scripture scholarship and in his scripture translation work. I think I think that's really interesting, and I think this uh, this comes up a lot of times in discussions of the church fathers, especially in context of often pitting one father against another or pitting one father against other Catholic beliefs. And I see this a lot out on the internet uh, with a Protestant apologist using church fathers in this way, right? And you often have. The, uh, a quote from a church father, maybe taking it a bit of a context sometimes and said, look, this church father says this about this thing here. But as you say here, I mean, in, on the scriptures in this case, but in so many cases, I find, and I think maybe I'll let you agree or disagree with me. <laughs> it's, it's my show though, Mike, so make sure you tread, tread carefully. But it seems like 
time and again, despite what you might see a church father say, they do submit to the authority of, of the Pope at the end of the day, or the, or the submit to the authority of the wider church at the end of the day, that regardless of what they might hold in their own opinions. And in Jerome's case, argue sometimes quite uh, bombastically for, right? They do submit to a higher authority time and again, right? Yeah, yeah, you see this in in uh, in the in the works of Saint Basil um, uh, of uh, of Cyril of Alexandria. You see it in um, John Chrysostom that when they needed to make an appeal, where did they go? Right, they went to the to the to the Bishop of Rome, and they 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 uh, they they. They called upon that authority. Now, sometimes they were disappointed in the response. Basil really wanted the Pope to intervene in matters in his region. He wanted the Pope to, to you know, just go in and start, you know, go, you know, busting heads and taking names, you know. And the Pope didn't do that. And and Basil was was profoundly disappointed by this. But he didn't say, as a result, that's not my Pope, right? No. He, he accepted it, okay, as this pope's judgment. He recognized that this pope had the authority, and he did not. He was disappointed, but he, di he didn't use that as a, as a reason to attack the authority of the pope. Um, we find so many of the fathers depending on the authority of the pope. Athanasius is another. Um, uh, I, of I, I find that often when people want to... Um, to dissent from this, what they do is they'll go through each of those witnesses. They'll go through Athanasius and Basil and Cyril and so on and Chrysostom, and and they'll 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 say, well, there's this little flaw with that this one, and I'll, oh, I, you know, there's a there's a loophole in that one, and they'll they'll find they'll find a little flaw in in each and every one of those witnesses. But still, you have the preponderance of witnesses, okay, and. If you take them all together, or if you take them individually, they're still professing a faith that you will not find in any evangelical church in America, at least. That's what I've seen, and probably anywhere in the world. You know, They are professing a faith that we can only find in the apostolic churches today, and that's what we have to walk away with. You know, there's this preponderance, preponderance of, of, um, of, of evidence that cannot be denied. Yeah, well said, Mike. Well said. I want to leave you with the last word here. I want to ask you just to tell the listener, maybe again, what we what we should take away as modern day Christians, modern day Catholics, looking at how the early church read Scripture. You've you've waxed poetic already about how we should be more appreciative. What else do you want to say about how we should engage with Scriptures, keeping in mind the early church's relationship with Scriptures? Well, I, I I like what I see a lot of people doing today, and that uh, so many people now are are subscribing to these these magazines, devotional magazines um, like Magnificat, like Word Among Us, where they give you the daily readings and they give you reflections on these readings. Sometimes from from saints who are long dead, sometimes from from Christians who are living today, and and they're giving you an opportunity to prepare for the liturgy. Okay, so you're not just going in. And, and and allowing yourself to be surprised by the readings and then being disappointed because you cannot hear what the lector is saying, you know, in your old ears or, you know, in my case, you, you can see what my problems are. Um, but they're, they're giving you an opportunity to go over these things and ruminate in these things. My wife really inspires me in this way because this is the way she lives the liturgy day after day after day. Um, and again, you can do this. Um, there are apps that do this for you today. Uh, you're, uh, the, uh, God is holding our hands. You know, He's lavishing gifts upon us, and and we should appreciate that. Um, the other thing is to 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 make ourselves aware of the history. You know, my book is one way to do that. To, to see what kind of value the fathers placed on the sacred scriptures, that they were willing to die for possessing the sacred scriptures. They were willing to die for attending the Eucharist. Do we have that kind of zeal? You know, hold ourselves accountable to the, to the accomplishments of our fathers. Get to know history. Be deep in history. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to be today. The, the, the more you know about history, the stronger your own identity is, the more you know who you are. I have friends who spend hours every week on genealogy. You know, they're doing all this 
these these web searches they're using all of these paid services you know they're searching databases in the old country they're searching databases in the united states you know they're getting help from the mormons right all this stuff you know so they can get their own genealogy why do we have a drive to do that because we want to know who am i the more important answer to the question of who who am i is 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 who am i as a christian because this is the only thing of, of eternal value. So be deep in history. Know what it means to be a Christian. Know what your fathers in the church have given you as a legacy. Because no one can take that away from you. You will hold on to that forever. And you can't lose it the way you can lose the property your grandparents left you. Or the money they put in a trust for you. Or the photographs that they gave you in a folder so that you would know what your great great grandfather looked like you can lose all those things in a fire you can lose all those things in a social upheaval you can't lose what the fathers fought and died to give you <laughs> amen <laughs> well said mike well said the book is how the fathers read the bible it's out from emmaus uh road publishing Anywhere else you want to point people towards to uh, read more on the subject or read more of the things that you've written? Uh, maybe a, a, another gateway, a gateway, gateway, gateway book into the Mike Aquilina uh, studies course. That's, that's, that's been <laughs> I love Robert Louis Wilkin. You know, he's my favorite scholar of the fathers. I love his book, The Christians as the Romans Saw Them, because it gives us sympathy for the persecutors. It helps us to understand why they thought it was necessary to go to all that trouble and all that social upheaval to persecute Christianity. It helps us then to appreciate what's different about Christianity and makes it seem so dangerous. I'll tell you what, you know, we're having this conversation today when there's upheaval going on in my country because of a supreme court decision yeah. right um and and you and and i'm seeing the most venomous things spoken out there on the web by, by some people who are old friends of mine you know the anti-catholic venom you know spewing out and i'm kind of kind of astonished by it but you know if um if you, if you read someone like wilkin you you understand where the persecutors were coming from, and you understand why they felt threatened by Christianity, uh, uh, by the power of Christianity to, to change lives and even to overturn the social order. In a sense, the persecutors are right. <laughs> but Wilkins, one of my favorite scholars, that, that, that one and the, his book, The Spirit of Early Christian Thought, is another of my favorite Wilkin books. And finally, his, one of his very recent books, um, the first thousand years, which is a history of the first millennium. Yeah, that sounds fantastic, Mike. Well, I'll put links to those and to your books and stuff in the in the show notes for this show. Um, and I'm sure we'll see you again very soon. I actually I, I put a joke on on my Instagram account months ago now when this book here first came because that same week two other books of yours arrived in my <laughs> mailbox unsolicited they just came from one of your publishers i didn't even ask for them but here i was with three mike Aquilina books all in one week and it was like it was you know a, a banner week for the little household we uh, had lots of you know our, our sofa is a little off kilter so lots of books to put under the sofa leg to kind of prop it prop it up we definitely enjoyed netflix a bit more level that week mike so. I, i'm glad you're finding me useful <laughs> yeah thank you thanks so much mike uh, i want to say god bless mike the work you're doing for the church it's phenomenal obviously and uh thank you for being here once again on the show uh it's truly a pleasure for me and for all of our listeners so thank you so much mike for being here thanks again for having me keith i always have a great time with you i'm glad that's good that's good <laughs> thanks <laughs>